I was an adopted kid, and I was raised by this uh, wealthy family who had been involved in, in uh, theater management, vaudeville management, the Keith Albee vaudeville circuit. And so uh, the house would be filled with retired vaudeville performers all the time, so I got to meet Billy Gaxton and Victor Moore and Ed Wynn and all those people that nobody's ever heard of. And I started going to the theater when I was really young. I think when I was six years old, I went to see Jumbo, the old Hippodrome Theater, that musical with uh, um, Jimmy Durante and an elephant. That was my first experience in the theater. So I was raised on, on, on uh, live theater, which was about the only good thing about the adoption. I never felt comfortable with the adoptive parents. I don't think they knew how to be parents. I probably didn't know how to be a son either. And uh, <clears throat> I, was, I stayed pretty much to myself. I had a fairly active inner life. I certainly didn't relate to much of anything they related to. They sent me away to school when I was nine, ten years old, so not to have me around, so that was fine. It was all right. I took care of myself. I liked school, if only when I was doing the stuff that I wanted to do, like. I was always very, very good at the classes that interested me, and, and very bad at the ones that didn't. I think I knew very, very young, or at least had some inkling of the direction that my life was going to take. And so I was always interested in the arts. I, I started painting and drawing when I was eight years old, and writing poetry when I was nine or ten. and. Uh, I wanted to be a composer after I discovered Bach when I was 12 and a half, but that didn't work out. He was too good. Obviously, uh, it's the way my mind works, or worked at the time. Those things interested me. I have no idea who my natural parents were. Back in the days when I was adopted, you weren't allowed to find that sort of thing out, so I couldn't. But uh, I don't think that matters much anyway. Some of the brightest kids that I've known I've met their parents, and I, I can't believe that there was any relationship between them, you know. I read as much as I could. I had a funny story. Um, they were, the family had a big library in their huge house in Larchmont, and leather-bound books. And I was looking for a book to read one night. I was, what, 14 maybe, 13? And who is this Ivan Turgenev? Turgenev, of course. And so I took one of the books out of the library. It was Virgin Soil, as a matter of fact. And I read it. And the next morning, I came down for breakfast. The family had to have breakfast together. It was a formality. And they were rather cool, I thought. I said, what's the matter? They said, there is a book missing from the library. I said, yes, it's by Ivan Turgenev, not pronouncing his name correctly. It's a wonderful book. I took it upstairs. It belongs in the library. You have left a gap on the shelves. That gives you some idea of the disparity between our points of view. I never felt that I related to these people, which may be interesting, because most kids are trapped into feeling an obligation to their natural parents. You know, for, for what? For, be, for being born, I guess. Foolish notion, but still. And since I didn't relate to these people, and I knew that I did, wasn't from them, uh, I had a kind of objectivity about the whole relationship. This is all second guessing, of course, but I suspect it probably was in my mind. I'm, I, I am a, a permanent transient. <laughs> That's probably where that line in the zoo story came from. I'm a permanent transient. My home is the sickening, rooming houses on the Upper West Side of New York City, which is the greatest city in the world, amen. But that's where that line came from, in the zoo story. Well, I got thrown out of a lot of schools, yeah, but because uh, <clears throat> I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to be home either. I didn't want to be anywhere I was. But I managed to get an education before I got thrown out in the stuff that interested me. Teachers seem to sense that in some terribly unformed way there might be something going on in the mind there that, that should be encouraged. And so they would encourage me toward the things that interested me. And that was nice. 
So you know, I'd, I'd learn something at one school, get thrown out, go to another, learn some more. There were some teachers who were very, very helpful, and as I say, sensed that uh, maybe I had a mind worth cultivating, and uh, pointed me in the right direction to a lot of things. I can't be specific about it, but uh, I know that was going on. These were all private schools, not public schools, in the bowels of, of the city. These were private schools, a lot of wealthy kids there. But the teachers were paid fairly well, and they were better educated than their students, which is not necessarily true in the New York public school system half the time. And uh, some bright people. And they, uh, you know, they had small classes, seven or eight kids in a class. and They could spend time finding out who the kids were. You say that so I, I'm very, very grateful that even though I didn't get along with my adoptive parents, they did offer me an extraordinarily good education. I was not going to many of the courses I was supposed to in my freshman and sophomore year. I was going to a lot of interesting courses the seniors were taking, getting a good education on a graduating level, <coughs> and of course being marked absent and failing my required courses. They didn't like that, and they gave me a choice, go to the courses I was supposed to or leave, and so I left. And you, I was the one being educated. I thought I should have some say as to the nature of my education. Foolish notion. I tried first when I was 13. Because I had my, one of my grandmothers had been giving me little Christmas presents. <coughs> I've had a few hundred dollars. And so I went into New York with my little suitcase and tried to get on an ocean liner. <laughs> went to the, whatever, Cunard or whatever, the, whatever the, the line was and discovered that I didn't have enough money and also I didn't have any identification or anything and they weren't going to let me on board the ship. I guess I'd been told that Greenwich Village was um, where whatever intellectual ferment was going on in, the, uh, in New York was going on, and that, <clears throat> that's where all the interesting people were. So I went there, and they were there. I uh, com completed, or not completed, continued my education by uh, going to see all the great abstract expressionist paintings and listening to all the contemporary music up at Columbia at Macmillan Theater, going to see all the wonderful off-off Broadway plays, and the paperback book market was around, so I could, you know, when I couldn't, when I couldn't steal a book, I could buy it real cheap. It was good. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> there were a lot of saloons that we all went to. All the writers, all the, all the painters, of course, would go to the, um, uh, Cedar, Cedar Bar, <coughs> and you would go there and watch them fall down, you know, sort of nice. <coughs> and then all the writers would be going to, um, what was that bar on the corner of Bleecker and McDougal called? San Remo. Everybody would be there sitting around talking, and if you wanted to be with the young composers, you'd go up to the uh, Russian Tea, not the Russian Tea Room, the, um, there was a bar on the southwest corner of... Um, Carnegie Hall, I forget what it was called. Now all the composers would be there. And we all knew each other. Everybody was friendly. Yeah, it was a nice time. One of my grandmothers had given me a tiny um, inheritance, which kept me in beer and uh, uh, sandwiches and uh, sharing a tiny apartment with five or six of my very close friends. <laughs> and also, uh, I would take jobs from time to time. The only one I liked was delivering telegrams for Western Union. That was a good job. I did that. You know, you showed up when you wanted to. And if, you, if you were really clever, you could earn, earn tips pretty easily. I think I knew I was going to be involved in the arts in some fashion when I was very young. That's why I wanted to be a composer and did painting and drawing and writing. I think that's, uh, it just seemed, inevitable to me. That's who I was, therefore that's what I would do.
I know that I liberated a uh, large typewriter from the Western Union Company and dragged it down to the apartment I was sharing with all my friends <coughs> and uh, just started writing this play. It took me two weeks. It's called The Zoo Story. And I'd been writing a lot of stuff until then. I'd made a couple of half-assed attempts at plays, which I never finished. And all of a sudden, I wrote The Zoo Story and I had a very odd sensation. <laughs> this isn't bad. This may even be individual. It was the first thing I ever wrote that I could say, you wrote this. All of the influences have been put, put aside, put under. You've learned enough. This is your voice. I was aware of that at the time. That was a good feeling. It's very hard to explain to anybody who isn't a playwright. <laughs> if, it's, if you're a playwright, and I, that's why I was not a very good poet and a bad novelist and a bad short story writer. And then I wrote a play and I figured out that that's what I was supposed to be doing all my life. And also, I just think, think that every writer, everybody in any of the arts, has a particular time when they can become individual. It's different from people. You know, some people, they're doing it when they're 18. Some don't get to it until they're 50. And the zoo story was that moment where I knew I'd written something good and individual. And you just take off from there. It's nice when it happens. I was obviously analyzing um, two opposite people, one who compromised too much on the way to... Uh, adulthood and the other was compromising nowhere at all and uh, there was bound to be a clash but that, that's merely plot I don't know I really know I never know the only play that I've known what began it was when I wrote a play about uh, Bessie Smith great black blues singer who was allowed to die and outside of Memphis in 1937 because she was black and the hospitals were white <coughs> Even there, she's not in the play, her blood is. But with the exception of that one, I write my plays to find out why I'm writing them, what's going on in my head. That is, is turning into a play, and I become aware that it's turning into a play, and so I, I write it down. So simple and so easy and so true. I'm not one of these didactic playwrights who says, you know, I must now write a play about this or that subject and find some characters. It comes into focus very slowly for me. And when it's sufficiently into focus, I can hear the characters, know them, and uh, put them in their action. I imagine each writer's life is very individual. I mean, some of us uh, have great celebrity. Others of us uh, keep fairly quiet. and Nobody knows who we are, which is nice. <coughs> some people have commercial success. Some people don't. There is no such thing as the writer's life. There is merely that time when you're sitting upstairs or wherever you sit and uh, you're writing something. And that's uh, very special and probably very individual for each person too. Ideas come into my head and I've got to get out of my head. <laughs> that's simple. I'm a playwright, therefore I write plays. That's what I do, that's what I am. I think it's true with all creative people. Some people are composers. Some people don't get it right. You know, Henry James thought he should be a playwright. He was wrong. Arthur Miller thought he should be a novelist. He was wrong. You know. Writing should be useful. If it can't uh, instruct people a little bit more about the responsibilities of consciousness, there's no point in doing it. But we all write because we don't like what we see and we want people to be better and different. I'm sure that's why we do it. There's a purpose to everything, except the Republican Party, perhaps. Except possibly to teach us fear and loathing. Well, I don't get up every morning and say, now can I find some risks I have to take? No. <clears throat> but. Um, I don't think I've compromised either. I don't think I've ever said to myself, gee, this is going to be an unpopular subject. Maybe I'd better not write it. Or uh, 
gee, maybe I better simplify here. No. Nor uh, do I do the reverse, try to make things, make myself look better by making them more complicated. No. You write what's in your head. I don't rewrite. Uh, well, not much. <clears throat> I think I probably do all the rewriting that I'm going to do before I'm aware that I'm writing the play. Because obviously creativity resists in the unconscious, resi resides in the unconscious, right? Probably resists the unconscious too. Resides in the unconscious. And my plays, I think, are pretty much determined before I become aware of them. I think they formulated there. And then, then they, they move into the conscious mind and then onto the page. And by the time I'm willing to write a, commit a play to paper, I pretty much know or can trust the characters to write the play for me. And so I don't uh, impose. I let them have their heads and say and do what they want, and it turns out to be a play. Not a celebrity. I don't think in those terms anyway. Uh, I was delighted that people liked it. That's fine, you know. But they liked uh, the zoo story, American Dream, and Death of Bessie Smith, Sandbox also. They liked those too. But this was different. This was on Broadway, therefore it was meant to be a rival. You know, ridic ridiculous attitudes like that. Commercial theater. You put up with that stuff. You know, I, I've written, what, 28 plays now. I think the majority of them have had their world premieres in small theaters. And of, of my 28 plays, maybe no more than half have been on Broadway. And I, I don't care. I, I'd much prefer, <coughs> most Broadway theaters are too big. I would much prefer a 400-seat theater to a 900-seat theater any time for my plays, which are basically chamber plays. Um, and I find the audiences, the smaller the theater, the more alert the audiences are. And the younger they are, the more intelligent they are. And so uh, I'd be perfectly happy never to have another play on Broadway. Ex except maybe you have a responsibility to hit those people too. I think you've got to uh, assume that nobody promised you a rose garden. <laughs> and sometimes it's going to be OK, and sometimes it's going to be tough. But if you haven't got a sufficient sense of self to uh, sur surmount either failure or success, you're, gonna, you're in trouble. I know that some of my plays that have been least popular are some of the best ones. And they'll, they'll figure it out eventually, you know. Uh, I've, I've never lacked self-confidence in, 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 in my talent as a writer. Uh, this, is, this sounds wrong, it sounds terrible, but it's true. I, I've never had doubts about my ability as a writer. You know, now that I'm getting very old, um, there's the possibility that my mind is going. Do you know that wonderful story about Bernard Shaw? <clears throat> that when he got into his 90s, I hope it's true, he was reading one of his earlier plays one day, and he was having trouble understanding it. And so he rewrote it and simplified it so he could understand it. <laughs> and they had to take his work away from him because he was doing that. <laughs> uh, might, have, might have helped some of them. <laughs> Not selling out, not lying, um, putting them down the way they want to be, and not compromising in uh, production or casting or anything of that sort. Yeah, I've, I've been pretty much uh, able to be my own person, which is nice. Maybe that was made fairly easy for me by the initial success of Virginia Woolf, I don't know, possibly. But uh, I've never been. You know, there are always pressures on you to sell out and do something different, but uh, I've got a kind of orneriness to me. This is the play that I wrote, and this is damn well the play I want done. I made one, one experiment. Uh, I said, all right, everybody tells me that this is a collaborative art. 
something I've never believed, by the way. It is a creative act, and then there's, there are people who do it for you. <coughs> um, with one play, I said, okay, all these people think they're so bright. I will do whatever they want, I, without, except for changing the text. And I put up with a lot of stuff that uh, I didn't like very much or didn't really approve of. It was a fiasco. And if I'm going to have a fiasco, I want it to be on my terms. I like to take my own credit and my own blame. Because I can make as many mistakes as the next person, you know. But I think my mistakes are more interesting. I'm not even sure I was thinking in those terms. Uh, when I was starting out, I'm not even sure that I think much about them now either. But um, I think it's uh, being able to do pretty well uh, what you think is useful. That's basically it. Because all art has got to be useful. If it's merely decorative or escapist, uh, it's a waste of time. I mean, you write whatever you write to try to make people behave the way you want them to behave, make them, make them think the way you think they should be thinking. And if they behave themselves, good. If they don't, tough. But achievement is uh, holding on to, to that goal, I suppose. All art is useful because it tells us more about uh, consciousness. And it should engage us into thinking and reevaluating re-examining our values to find out whether stuff we think we've been believing for 20 years still has any validity. Uh, and if art, art's got to help us understand that uh, values change, and if we've, if we've stopped exploring the possibilities of our mind, uh, then, then we're asleep. And why not just stay asleep? So all art has got to be utilitarian and useful. It's one of the great things about uh, African art. It's not made as art. It's utilitarian. It's made for religious dance purposes. And uh, people who make it don't think of themselves, gee, I'm a, great, I'm, a, I'm a great sculptor. No. They're making something useful. I think this is true with novels, plays, poems. And I think basically all serious creative people feel the same way. So many words get me, gets misused uh, all the time. I don't think much about my values. Uh, I know what they are if anybody pins me down as to what my, value, my values are. That I will do whatever I possibly can to save us from uh, the forces of darkness that are trying to take over our democracy, and that I believe we are a slowly, peacefully evolving revolutionary society. That's what we were, we were formed at by, by, the, by, the, by the merchant class. And that's why it should be a peacefully evolving society. Uh, try to keep us awake to the fact that democracy demands uh, informed voting and that uh, democracy is fragile. And if we don't stay on top of things, uh, we'll get what we deserve, as we seem to be doing right now. And I do think that all art is fundamentally political in the, in the large philosophical sense. Participate in your own life fully. Uh, don't uh, sink back into that which is easy and safe. Uh, you're alive only once, as far as we know. And uh, what could be worse than getting to the end of your life and realizing you hadn't lived it? Well, I can't do it in my own work because I can't look at my own work that way. Uh, if, I, if I read a book, go to a play, see a painting, or um, hear a piece of music that makes me 
expand the parameters of my response, makes me think differently, maybe makes me think perhaps even more completely about something, then I've had a useful experience. Otherwise, as I said, it's merely decorative and a waste of time. Let's see. Um, parachute jumping. I'd sort of like to do that. If I could be guaranteed that the damn thing would open and I wouldn't break both my legs when I landed. That'd be fun to do, I guess. Uh, no, I would just like to keep on writing plays for a while so that uh, I can get better and more useful. I, I believe I'm getting right now, this weekend, a thing called the Lifetime Achievement Award from uh, uh, Broadway, which strikes me as a little premature. I haven't, I haven't done my lifetime work yet, but I suppose they have to give it to you too early if they're going to give it to you before you're dead. Well, um, the dangers to democracy uh, on, the pack, on the part of a, an electorate that I think is voting far too selfishly. That is, that most of our voting doesn't have anything to do what is, with what is going to be most good for the most people. It's, it's selfish and uninformed voting. I, I find that terribly dangerous. I find that that can kill a democracy uh, very, very quickly. I find that the uh, inroads on civil liberties in our society are terribly dangerous. There's never been any danger from the far left to the United States. The death of democracy is fascism. And I see us moving closer and closer to, to, to that compliance all the time. And that worries me a lot. But I'm not going to write a, 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 a didactic political play because that's a, a rant. And, and there's no point in it. If I can just try to persuade people, stay awake, live it fully, don't sell out, don't compromise. If you can encourage people to do that, then there's a hope. Try to get into your own mind a little bit. Uh, figure out what it is you want to, you want to do with your life what you really want to do, who you really are. Don't waste your life doing something that you're going to end up being either bored with or, or feel was futile or a, or a waste of time. Um, it's your life, live it, live it as fully and as usefully as you possibly can. Useful be, being uh, the most important thing there. Life must be lived usefully, not, 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 not selfishly. And a usefully lived life is probably going to be uh, ultimately more satisfying.